Good evening, I'm Asha Tomlinson. Tonight, assessing the damage, beginning the cleanup, and giving thanks it wasn't worse. We take it hour by hour, you know, getting organized with insurance was big. We're on the scene in the aftermath of a tornado. Wildfire smoke can be transported several thousands of kilometers. Also tonight, the BC wildfires keep on burning. Now a new threat, smoke. Canada contemplates opening the U.S. border. It's a conversation that is happening. And from grassroots to property ownership. How will you hold yourselves accountable to the community? I mean, that's such a good question. Black Lives Matter Canada looks forward. This is The National. Across Canada tonight, people are dealing with the real-life impact of natural disasters. In a moment, we'll look at BC's wildfires and the smoke in Alberta. But first, the aftermath of yesterday's devastating tornado in Barrie, Ontario, north of Toronto. It carved out a path five kilometers long and wider in parts than the length of a football field. At least 20 homes were destroyed. Another 60 declared too unsafe to enter. Ellen Morrow is tracking the story in Barrie, Ontario again for us tonight. Ellen, what is the situation on the ground there now? Well, Asha, these used to be nice backyards. Now this is a disaster zone. Take a look at that house in the far corner there behind me. The roof completely ripped away. Coming over to this house here beside us, you see debris just strewn everywhere on the back patio. And going up to the second floor there, take a look at that headboard in what used to be a second floor bedroom. That just gives you a small snapshot of the devastation here and what residents here in Barrie are now contending with. So much devastation, the scale of it only just beginning to set in. We take it hour by hour, um, you know, getting organized with insurance was big um, and um, just trying to understand what we need. Greg Hepburn's roof was completely torn off as he and his partner rushed to their basement. They only moved into their home a month and a half ago. When the glass blew out, um, we circled back um, and kind of huddled by the staircase for some sort of shelter in to understand what was going on. But how to understand this? 150 homes damaged, dozens now completely unlivable. That's a tornado. The tornado, an EF2, tore through yesterday afternoon with little warning. Its winds topping 210 kilometers an hour. The storm's ferocity made clear by its aftermath. So you can see the top window here that is undamaged. That is where I seen the storm coming through. When Bonnie Davies was home with her teenage son when the tornado struck. He walked out of the house and he says, Mom, this is what you mean by a tornado. I can't believe it did this already. Right? So it just brings the reality of, you know, life changes in a moment. Premier Doug Ford toured the damage this afternoon. Just thank, thank God no one, uh, no one was killed. It's an absolute miracle. Barry's mayor said the storm's timing makes it even more difficult. Coming at the end of COVID, it's, it's hard to take, and most of all for the people who've lost their, their possessions and, and had members of their family injured. 11 people were brought to hospital and are now recovering. The cleanup here just getting started as the community bands together. There's no power, and people really don't want to leave their homes, so bring the coffee to them. Many residents are still in shock. That thing used to be up there. Jack Beaver doesn't know where his family will stay tonight. That's it. Just, just depressed. Yeah. Yeah. We're just wondering what's going to happen next. And Ellen, what are residents telling you about the next few days and weeks to come? Well, it really is an hour by hour, day by day situation for residents, Asha. They have to talk to insurance companies. They have to talk to construction companies. There are so many logistical hurdles. How do you even begin to clean up from something like this? And not to mention the emotional distress that comes along with losing your home. So for the residents here, this is a tragedy that's going to continue on with its ripple effects for some time. It is far from over. Thank you so much, Ellen Morrow in Barrie, Ontario tonight. In British Columbia, more crews are on their way to help fight what's being called an unprecedented wildfire season. The numbers help tell the story here. More than 300 are burning across the province. 
30 could pose a potential threat to the public. And tonight, over 16,500 properties are under an evacuation order or alert. Officials say reinforcements are on their way, but the fear is that won't be enough. Now calls are growing for the province to declare a state of emergency. Katie Nicholson is in the BC interior tonight, one of the hardest hit regions of the province. Katie, what's it like where you are? Well, Ash, if you just look behind me over my shoulder here, you'll be able to see smoke sort of billowing out. That's actually from the Sparks Lake fire. That's the largest fire currently burning in the province. It's one of the reasons there are air quality advisories through much of the province. And that is just one of the things people here have to deal with this weekend. My son passed away two years ago, so I didn't want to lose that. Ken Ledoux's most precious belongings packed for a quick escape. He's learned from experience. Four years ago, this out of control fire came dangerously close to this area. Now, the village is caught between three major fires and is under an evacuation alert. But I just kind of worried about this stuff here. Eh? It's all that six age brush or whatever lit up. I wouldn't be 30 seconds, I'd be out of here. So it wouldn't take long to burn out. With more than 300 fires burning, Cache Creek's fire chief wonders why the province hasn't yet declared a state of emergency. It's five times worse this year than 2017, and I don't know what they're waiting for. Like, uh, we have villages burning up, and people evacuated all over, and I'm not sure what's going on there. The Premier says he is prepared to make the call, Thank just you, uh, not yes. yet. There is not one advantage at all from calling a state of emergency except to bring more people together. Not so, says the fire chief. I think it would be a huge world of difference. They could bring resources in. We have uh, operators and stuff just sitting with their equipment. Hundreds are out of their homes, thousands ready to bolt. Road closures and so much smoke. The fires are also carving a big slice out of business. With roads being closed, we're losing revenue. We're losing uh, our customers being able to come to our markets. Temperatures remain high, the risk of fire extreme, and there are fears lightning could spark more fires. And while there's some rain in the forecast, the wildfire service says it isn't enough. Unfortunately, at this, at this time, it would take a considerable amount of precipitation across the province to have any significant impact. And so, for Ken Ledoux and thousands of others, nothing to do but wait, watch, and worry. Katie, clearly a tense weekend ahead and no state of emergency declared just yet, but the province is getting some outside help. Yeah, that's right. So 20 firefighters from Quebec arrived today and next Saturday, 100 firefighters are coming from Mexico to help shore up the ranks here. That's so needed because the, they're really stretched here as it is. The province is trying to triage which fires it attends to uh, and where it sort of devotes its resources. And those workers from out of province, out of country, will work in COVID bubbles. Uh, that's just to, for everybody's safety because while, you know, uh, this firefight is continuing. There is still an ongoing battle with COVID-19. Asha? All right. Thanks, Katie. Katie Nicholson near Cache Creek, B.C. tonight. You're welcome. Much of that smoke from those B.C. wildfires is drifting eastward. It's especially intense in northern Alberta as smoke from B.C. blends with that from wildfires in Saskatchewan. Paige Parsons shows us how it's become a threat of its own. <laughs> Deborah Ward gets prepared every year for fire season and the smoke it brings. She has asthma. It's usually controlled, but with the smoke starts coming in, then I'm upping my inhaler and I'm ch checking my pulse ox all the time to make sure that my levels are okay. And I'm wearing mask like this, not so much for COVID these days, but just to help me breathe. Edmonton, like much of Western Canada, has been blanketed in smoke from wildfires in BC, Alberta and Saskatchewan, prompting Environment Canada to issue air quality warnings throughout the region. Particles in that haze could be harmful to health, so people are being told to stay indoors as much as possible. The people at highest risk of um, getting sick or having an injury from smoke exposure are um, not just infants and small children, but also anyone with heart and lung disease and also um, frail people like the elderly that we need to take into consideration. 
Blue Sky Canada pulls data from across Canada and the U.S. to track smoke drifting across the continent. This modeling expert says don't be surprised to see western smoke drift to the other side of the country. Wildfire smoke uh, can be transported several thousands of kilometers before it's dispersed into the background or settles out by being washed up by rain or being, being just being picked up by the ground. These kinds of unhealthy, smoky summer days are here to stay as wildfire seasons get longer and more extreme, according to the BC Centre for Disease Control. So for individual residences, we recommend that people close windows and doors if it's safe to do so without getting too hot and run a portable air cleaner. For now, Deborah Ward is limiting her time outdoors, but it's scary knowing what could happen if things get worse. And with wildfires still burning across western Canada, it's difficult to say when the air will clear again. Paige Parsons, CBC News, Edmonton. In northwest Ontario, reinforcements are set to arrive tomorrow as crews continue to battle some 90 active wildfires. At least 32 are burning out of control. More than 100 firefighters and support staff are expected to arrive from Mexico tomorrow. Officials say the crews will be required to follow Ontario's health and safety guidelines. And in southwestern Ontario, the issue is heavy rainfall. Flooding is creating havoc for a hospital in Windsor. There's some potential damage to equipment. We're going to have to shut down the cardiac cath lab until at least Monday. Uh... This is what it looks like inside the basement lab. Instead of IVs and monitors, staff are working with mops and squeegees. Environment Canada says the region could get 60 millimeters of rain by Saturday. But that's a drop in the bucket compared to the situation in Western Europe. It is seeing some of the worst flooding in decades. At least 120 people are dead, hundreds more are missing. As Tessa Arcilla explains, the full magnitude of the disaster won't be clear for days. Two months worth of rain fell in just two days, causing devastating floods, the worst seen in decades. As rivers burst their banks, the water came in fast and strong, giving residents no time to escape and leaving staggering damage in its wake. Houses, cars and people swept away by powerful currents. The worst hit country, Germany. Speaking in Washington, Chancellor Angela Merkel says they don't know how many may have died. Neighboring Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Switzerland have also been affected. Hundreds are still unaccounted for, with some areas completely cut off, leaving residents trapped. This German resident says he felt bad he couldn't help people waving at him from windows while houses were collapsing. Some 15,000 police, soldiers and emergency service workers have been deployed in Germany to help with search and rescue efforts. Scientists have long warned that human emissions could cause extreme weather patterns that were likely to occur with higher intensity and frequency, putting climate change squarely back on the political agenda. Earlier this week, the EU unveiled its most ambitious plan yet to tackle climate change, challenging the rest of the world to move away from fossil fuels within a decade. But by acting now, when we still have the policy choices, we can do things another way. But for those whose lives have been left in ruins by the impact of extreme and unpredictable weather, putting a stop to such devastation from ever happening again couldn't come soon enough. Tessa Arcilia, CBC News, London. Turning now to the COVID-19 situation in Canada, Quebec is trying a new incentive to convince more people to get vaccinated. Starting next month, the province will hold weekly draws for $2 million in cash prizes and bursaries. Those who have had at least one dose of the vaccine will be eligible. In Ontario... It was like the most incredible thing, being back here, the energy. But it's, it's a different feeling to see them in person. People are jumping into step three of the reopening plan a few days earlier than scheduled. It means gyms are open as well as movie theaters and indoor dining at restaurants is allowed. Nightclubs can also reopen with limited capacity. And some more good news, the Toronto Blue Jays are coming back. It's been a long time uh, since uh, we've seen the Jays play on home turf, but we're uh, really happy to be able to welcome them back home on July 30th.
The federal government has approved the team's request, giving it a national exemption to return to the Rogers Center. The plan includes pre- and post-arrival testing of everyone crossing the border and additional testing four times a week for those who are unvaccinated. The Jays' first home game in Toronto will be on July 30th. Justin Trudeau has signaled he's considering mid-August as a possible time to open the U.S. border to fully vaccinated Americans. Travis Danraj spoke with people who just can't wait for that moment and others who say it's a risk. It's a 20-minute drive between Windsor and Detroit, but for the past 16 months, Jenny Foreman and Nick Thompson have felt worlds apart. We've now missed two of each of our birthdays, Christmas, um, uh, both of our parents, um, we haven't been able to get all together. It's, it's, it's sad. It's time lost. Thompson says he'll be waiting at the Ambassador Bridge day one if Canada moves forward with plans to reopen the border to fully vaccinated Americans in mid-August. Pick her up and take her out on a date and, and hang out and, and see each other because it's, it's been ages. Dr. David Poon started the group Faces of Advocacy to help reunite cross-border families. Details need to be cleared up. That includes a 15-day minimum stay for U.S. foreign nationals and all foreign nationals coming into Canada. Whether or not toddlers will be beholden to the quarantine. It's a conversation that is happening fully advised by Canadian public health authorities. Indeed, there are worries about the move and variants. We may have the emergence of a new variant that is not as responsive to vaccines. And that would be a huge problem for us. Florida resident John Adams was so upset, he paid out of pocket to launch this ad campaign, but says he'll run thank you ads. Thank you for opening the border so we can get back to our family home in Canada. Once border plans are firmed up, still he's frustrated there is no news out of the White House on when the U.S. border will open to vaccinated Canadians. I've been frustrated with... Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, but nowhere near as frustrated as I am with our own president. And that is one of the major unknowns at this point. CBC News reached out to the White House for comment on whether America plans to fully reopen its border to fully vaccinated Canadians. So far, no comment. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Ottawa. In Los Angeles, the alarming surge in COVID's Delta variant means masks will once again be mandatory. The new order takes effect just before midnight on Saturday. Masks will have to be worn indoors in public settings and in businesses, even if you're vaccinated. Officials call it a common sense measure that isn't too difficult to follow. But a measure millions of Americans are having trouble following is vaccination. Some aren't convinced they need it. Some just keep putting it off. Katie Simpson spoke with a woman who knows how horribly that can turn out. This is the young, young him, like the 70s, and he had long hair. When Michelle Preisler looks at her husband Daryl's life in pictures, it is a devastating reminder her husband won't be at her side for any more family memories. It's very painful, but I can't go there. See, I'm not supposed to go there, but that's grieving, so grieving is really hard. Michelle says her husband got COVID at a family wedding in April and died a month later. Vaccines were available at the time, but Daryl kept putting it off as he was busy with work, and he worried about side effects because of medication he was on at the time. And I know that if my husband would have gotten that vaccine, he'd still be here. And he's not here, and he's not coming back. So if anybody can learn from this, what I'm going through, please learn. Last month in Maryland, 130 people died of COVID. None of them had been vaccinated. What's happening here is part of a much larger national trend. Nearly all new COVID hospitalizations and deaths are among individuals who've not had their shots. There is a clear message that is coming through. This is becoming a pandemic of the unvaccinated. After weeks of declines, daily cases, hospitalizations and deaths are all on the rise in the U.S. Every patient who wheels through our ICU door basically is an unvaccinated person who ends up regretting that decision. Michelle is doing what she can to cope with her regret. I can't even think of the good times because that hurts me because there aren't any more coming. Uh, yeah, we had a, so much fun in our life together. 
and I will think of them later on. I can't do it right now. The one thing she can do, she says, is hope her husband's story can spare another family from the pain she's in. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Pasadena, Maryland. The remains of a third Canadian have been found at the scene of the condo collapse outside Miami. Sources identify the third victim as 23-year-old Michelle Anna Pazos. She was visiting her father when the building caved in three weeks ago. At least 97 people are confirmed dead. One other Canadian is still unaccounted for. Back in this country, Manitoba's new Indigenous Reconciliation Minister apologized tonight. Minutes after being sworn in yesterday, Alan Lajamodier, who is Métis, said those who ran residential schools believed they were doing the right thing. Tonight in a statement, he says he wants to acknowledge the words he used were wrong. He goes on to say he's reaching out to Indigenous leaders to begin to chart a path forward together. Statistics Canada is responding to calls for a more accurate count of people who belong to racial minority groups. For years, anyone who ticked off more than one box ended up in a mixed category, and that shortchanged the tally for individual groups. Rafi Bujikanian shows us why this fix is needed. She raised us to be proud, strong black women, and she raised us to know and be proud of our Indian heritage. Kamala Harris last summer, before she became the first woman and first mixed race vice president of the U.S. But if she were to fill out the Canadian census, Harris would be counted as neither black nor South Asian. Instead, she would be grouped with others of mixed race in a category called multiple visible minorities. Five years ago, about 232,000 Canadians were counted that way. There's a lot of uh, buried, inherent systemic barriers. For a long time, this federal civil servant was one of the few black people in his department. I noticed when I went to work in the public service, there was this thing called the lone black syndrome. We just see um, silos of lone black people roaming the streets at lunchtime. Nguafusi also believes a more accurate count would lead to better government policy. But for this employment lawyer, hiring is the main issue. It basically makes it impossible for the government to respond with any credibility. He's representing clients in a proposed class action lawsuit alleging black civil servants face systemic discrimination in the federal public sector. And that's a major challenge for both the employers and for those employees that are seeking fairness and equity in hiring. Statistics Canada says it will break down this year's census data more effectively. People want more details on that, and that's why uh, we are hoping to do those change, like a modification. But also keep in mind that the, the, the purpose of the census is also to uh, monitor the trends and uh, to see how Canadian society evolves um, over time. It will take time for the public to see the changes. The new data on multiple visible minorities will be ready in October of next year. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. House prices and sales across the country are cooling down from their pandemic peak, but the rush is far from over. There's a house that's three doors away that's sold in about six hours. Up next, the challenges for prospective buyers and sellers. Plus, a North American first. When someone walks in here, how do you want them to feel? I want them to feel welcomed. Of all, I want them to feel like this is this can be their home. Inside Black Lives Matter Canada's new space. And later, a moment eight months in the making. <laughs> Love is in the air again. We're back in two. Welcome back. For many Canadians, the dream of home ownership is starting to feel like just that, a dream. The pandemic-fueled buying frenzy that has driven already high prices through the roof is finally starting to cool. But as Jacqueline Hansen explains, competition remains fierce, and not just in big cities. Don Granley spent the pandemic working on a new project, fixing up a vintage trailer. But she and her husband don't have the space to store it, so they want to sell their house and move. There's a house that's three doors away that's sold in about six hours. 
that's a potential problem for local buyers. COVID-19 has created a huge demand in places like Cochrane, Alberta from people across the country. In the last six months, over half of our buyers are coming from out of town or out of province. This realtor says sales nearly doubled in the past year. It's insane. We're so busy and uh, completely run off our feet. That's despite the fact that technically the spring real estate frenzy is subsiding. Sales and average prices across the country have fallen from record highs in March. The market is showing signs of stability and sort of a slow march to normalcy. Still, the national average price is up 25% over the past year. And in some suburbs, particularly in BC and Ontario, it's jumped even higher. Another blow to young prospective home buyers. A recent poll found that nearly half surveyed have considered moving out of Ontario in order to buy a home. Land development engineering firm Crozier is trying to prevent that by giving employees $20,000 towards a down payment on their first home. Really hearing their horror stories day after day week after week of our employees losing out on homes as a result of bidding wars. For prospective sellers like Granley, bidding wars are a double-edged sword. We're gambling. If we sell this house, we may not be able to find anything um, comparable to live in for even the same price, which makes no sense to my brain. She's ready to list, but hopes to wait out the pandemic real estate rush just a little longer. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead, my conversation with three mayors about restrictions and reopenings. A certain uh, politician in Alberta keeps saying this is going to be the best summer ever. And it isn't. Up next, their message for this moment of the pandemic. Of and behind the scenes of Black Lives Matter's first permanent home. The popcorn is popping in Ontario movie theaters tonight. The province moved into stage three of its reopening plan today, opening movie theaters, gyms, and indoor dining with reduced capacity. The rules vary across the country, as does the pace of reopening. But a tentative return to normal is the ultimate goal, coast to coast to coast. As communities start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, we're joined by three mayors of three cities across the country. Joining me now is Nahed Nenshi, mayor of Calgary, Bonnie Crombie, mayor of Mississauga, Ontario, and Sandra Masters, mayor of Regina. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Mayor Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure, Asha. Mayor Crombie, I, I want to start with you. How are you yeah. feeling now that things are reopening in Ontario? Well, it, thanks for the question. It's certainly an exciting day for all of us. I spent the morning at my F45 gym working out indoors for the first time since I think October 2020. <laughs> of course, we in Peel Region and Toronto have been in lockdown longer than anyone else, uh, right across North America, in fact. Uh, so we saw the broader reopening happening in June, uh, but we've been in lockdown since November 23rd, even though we had restrictions on us from October as well. So uh, I did work out indoors at F45, and then this afternoon I went over to the Irish Club, and we had a few pints uh, indoors, which was just a great delight. But I do caution people to be careful and, and, to, and to show caution. I mean, this is the first time we've been amongst so many people in a very, very long time, probably 15 months since we've been together as a group. And although the restrictions are broadened, it's so important to continue to mask if you can't safely physically distance uh, indoors um, and outdoors, in fact follow the advice of public health, and by all means, if you don't have your first or second dose of the vaccine, because vaccines work, book that as soon as possible. And Mayor Masters, uh, I mean, you're a bit further ahead in Saskatchewan, right? Uh, with restrictions lifted earlier this week, how are things going? You know, uh, you can feel the excitement when you go up, out, and, and the sense of relief people have. We've got 
you know, 73% of our citizens with uh, in the province with first doses and 57% 12 plus with second doses, which has allowed our reopening. Uh, clearly, to echo what Mayor uh, Crombie had to say, vaccines are the pathway out of here and, and the pathway, the continued pathway to, to, to safe gathering. Um, I'm incredibly pleased to report that our riders are going to be back in action on August 6th, and we are days away from selling out to the tune of 30,000 and people wow. are going to be present. Um, and really, you know, we do have some citizens who are have some concerns. And the message really is show respect to those individuals who wish to wear masks, show respect to that physical space that we've all been adhering to for so long. Um, and go get vaccinated. Mayor Nenshi, uh, we're talking about the Calgary Stampede. It's going on right now. What kind of challenges have you been facing as things are loosening up there? Well, certainly we have been uh, now free of restrictions in Alberta since July the 1st. Uh, with some exceptions, you still have to mask on transit and taxis and shared ride vehicles, uh, obviously in hospitals and acute care settings. Many employers and many stores are still requiring masking as well. And so I echo what my colleagues are saying. You know, it is exciting that those of us who have both of our vaccines plus two weeks can get out there a little bit more. But, you know, people are at very different comfort levels. And so there are some folks who are raring to go. And there are others who are saying, not now, not yet. I don't feel right. And we're just going to honour everybody. There's a lot we have to process. We've been through a lot. There's been a lot of trauma. You know, people have missed their weddings or their graduations, or maybe they're just now organising the funeral for their grandmother. And so we're getting through that together. But what's interesting, and we're just a couple weeks ahead of our friends uh, across the country, is how people have shifted even in those two weeks. Again, it's all about vaccines. It's all about vaccine numbers being high. They have to be much higher. We must get to 75 or 80 percent second dose before September or the fourth wave, which will come, will be devastating. I hope that that fourth wave will not be devastating. So we need to continue to focus on that. But we also need to help people at their own pace, come back. And, and, and a lot of folks are saying, let's get back to normal. And here's the thing, I don't wanna go back to normal. Normal wasn't that great for a lot of people. And so what I wanna go back to is a community that is even stronger, that is even more resilient, that has learned the lessons of community through COVID. That sounds pretty heavy for Stampede, right? It's about mini donuts and uh, <laughs> rodeo, but Really, we're taking it very, very seriously that this is the first major event in Canada post-pandemic. We're being very responsible, um, and people will come at their own pace. And I will say that uh, Nashville North, which is one of the, shall we say, <clears throat> more intimate experiences at Stampede, is the first major venue that is requiring proof of vaccination or a rapid test on site uh, to be able to enter. And that's been going very well. So we're happy to be the pilot project for other organizations that want to do that. Okay, now this has to be rapid fire style because we're running out of time. But looking back 16 months ago, what would you tell yourself knowing what you know now? Mayor Crombie. We will get through this. We will be resilient and we will be even stronger. And I want to thank everyone for demonstrating that spirit of Mississauga that shone so bright. Mayor Masters. It ain't over till it's over. And so to remain constantly vigilant, to um, continue to show kindness to each other and support everyone locally, whether that's business or those social groups that are providing for our most vulnerable citizens. And Mayor Nenshi. Focus on mental health as much as on physical health. Those words kindness and empathy are what gets us through. I appreciate your time. Thank you and be well. Thank you. Thank you. After the break, inside Black Lives Matter Canada's new home. It was really important for us to actually have a space in which uh, it's, it's black, black owned and black operated. What this first of its kind space means for the movement. Plus, summer school excitement. Why students want to return to the classroom. But first. You, you got what I need. But you say he just a friend. Biz Marquis, a pioneering rapper, has died at the age of 57. The self-proclaimed clown prince of hip-hop may have been best known for his 1989 classic, Just a Friend, but he also thrived as a producer, DJ, and beatboxer. 
The cause of death has not been released. Downtown Toronto is getting a new hub for black activism and art. Originally a Victorian mansion, the building was bought for just over $8 million by Black Lives Matter Canada. When it opens early next year, it will be a place of permanence for the community to meet, create and organize because black spaces matter. We got an exclusive tour. Okay, let's go do this. With the keys handed over, Black Lives Matter Canada is laying new roots. The Wild Seed Centre for Arts and Activism, a first of its kind in North America. And this BLM team can't contain their excitement. Whoa! Hello! Hello. Hey, hey, nice hey, we're here. here. Co-founder Rodney Deverlis is our tour guide. When someone walks in here, how do you want them to feel? I want them to feel welcomed, above all. I want them to feel like this, is, this can be their home too. I want them to feel safe. I want them to feel free to be themselves, um, to bring their full authentic self. And nobody's gonna police them or judge them or restrict their access here. Okay, where are we gonna go? Start from the top? Let's start from the top. Okay, the floor. let's go. Let's go. <laughs> We've been engaged in this specific project for, for two years now, really. Wow. This is a beautiful space. Yes. When you look at this, what do you envision? One of the things that we love about this movement is that it's not just talking about a black pain, but it's providing space for us to celebrate. I really stuck it out, trying to see it through. And so we really imagine that this could be a space in which activists and artists can come together and celebrate. This is where we anticipate uh, the laughter and the joy uh, and the fullness of blackness to be here. And we searched all year, all over the city. Black Canadian history is all around this 10,000 square foot property. It's close to Toronto's historically black neighborhoods, minutes away from the iconic black bookstore, a different book list. And just down the block, the old Toronto office of civil rights activist, Marcus Garvey. We know that we, we are building on a lineage of strong black organizing. And we know that there's many people that have come before us. And part of that is looking at our past as a way of shaping, shaping our future. I am oh, obsessed this is nice. with this space. Ooh. So this will be where the work happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so much of activism is meeting. It's the not sexy part of it where groups have to come together and figure out what is the strategy, argue and debate it out. We going for a larger space is to be able to share it out. Um, and so we've already committed to free space for all BLM chapters. And so this very much belongs to the Black Lives Matter movement in Canada. We also really want to invite those who are organizing but don't have space. BLM's new home is black owned. They purchased it outright for $8.1 million. Donations paid for the majority of it, locally and through the BLM Global Network Fund. And the City of Toronto is expected to contribute $250,000 toward upgrades. Those upgrades will be led by Black architects and interior designers. And how will you hold yourselves accountable to the community? Because, you know, you're coming from this radical, you know, grassroots group into this amazing, beautiful building and you're going to have to deal with a lot more financial <laughs> responsibilities and, and you're going to have to make a lot of hard decisions. Absolutely. I mean, that's such a good question. One of the things we've had to grapple with was the evolution of this work. And so as a charity, we have many requirements of how, to, how, how we have to report, how you know, we, our, our relationships with donors, ensuring that we're transparent with folks about, um, about where their money's going and ensuring that we're not hoarding resources and that when people donate, they have something that they can reference and utilize back and forth. And the number one way that we want to do it is right from the beginning. Next month, we're going to be doing community consultations. So before we even touch before we even like move a single thing we want to know from people what do you want how do you want how do you want this space to be responsive to you and i'm sure that that's going to be exciting i'm sure that's going to be contentious i'm sure it's going to be passionate uh, and we welcome that we welcome that passion there are so many spaces in this building yes this is actually one of the spaces where we hope to actually keep 
it's intention. It's an art room. Yeah. What kind of programs do you hope to offer here? We have so many programs that are, have been in development, have been launched, and are want, waiting to be launched, and we're anxiously needing space to be able to make them happen. Uh, we've been in development of a family support program, um, which is, would be a comprehensive program to support um, families of victims of police violence. Um, we also have an artist in residency program that we're hoping to expand. So it's a combination of both internal BLM Canada pro, um, programs and initiatives, but also making space for uh, collectives and external programs. How will you measure success? For me, I'm really interested in longevity. And so I'm really, I've seen so many of our movements come and go. We end up getting pushed out of these neighborhoods that we actually help create. And so it was really important for us to actually have a space in which uh, it's, it's black, black owned and black operated, and that it's actually black people at the table that are a part of the conversation on how to best service us. Freedom is, is really the goal here yeah. in many ways. Good luck with all your work. Thank you so much. Congratulations you. to you and the whole team. Thank you, thank you. It's been a team effort. Up next, lessons from the classroom, summer school edition. I walked into class, saw a couple of my old friends. I instantly got way more comfortable. How students are hoping for a pandemic reset. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Summer school got underway this week in many parts of the country. It's a chance for students who struggled with pandemic learning to hit reset. For some, that means catching up with the curriculum and with friends. Deanna Sumanak Johnson reports. It's summer school time in Edmonton, and for once, these students are actually happy about it. It was a little bit of an odd year going back and forth online and in school. So I thought this would kind of be a good opportunity to kind of do better in the class. I walked into class, saw a couple of my old friends. I instantly got way more comfortable. After a year of juggling in person and online classes, these kids and their teacher are relieved to be back in a classroom every day. And you feel like the information sinks in more. Uh, you're making that connection. Uh, I feel like they get more out of the, you know, the course. A year of only sporadic classroom learning has made summer schools surprisingly popular in Winnipeg too. Last year the numbers were a bit lower. I think people were a little more hesitant and a little more cautious about going to in-person classes. But this year our numbers have just jumped right back up to where we were pretty much pre-pandemic. But in many other places in Canada, summer school is still virtual. A big disappointment, particularly to students and parents who felt that online schooling is what led to disengagement and lower grades in the first place. That's what happened to Nathan Perrett, who couldn't pass grade 7 without boosting his math mark through summer school. But that was, once again, virtual. Well, it was, it was a hard blow, I'm not going to lie, but it's, it just seems like it's a never-ending cycle of looking at a screen, um, looking at uh, a teacher talking to you virtually. Other families turn to tutors who can't promise socialization but can offer one-on-one -on -one help. They will benefit from having that ongoing practice and um, just keeping their brains stimulated and keeping their brains active so that when it comes time to go back to school, um, you know, it's not so much of a shock for them. All in hopes that by September at least some of these kids can catch up and that learning in the company of friends will be back for good. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, the Eiffel Tower is officially back in business with some restrictions, of course. We feel really lucky. The excitement from those visiting the famous landmark is our moment. The Eiffel Tower officially reopened today, more than eight months after COVID-19 forced its longest closure since the Second World War. As the tower's countdown clock hit zero, masked visitors couldn't contain their excitement. For a few of those people, it became a day they will never forget. There was excitement and romance in the air on the tour's first day back, and tonight, it's our moment. They say true love waits, and for this German romantic, the wait to propose to his girlfriend atop the iconic Eiffel Tower is finally over. And my girlfriend, no, my 
wife uh, want to visit per Paris all the time in your life? A speechless. <laughs> I can't say anything. I think it's a beautiful place. The Eiffel Tower symbolizes Paris and symbolizes uh, France. And uh, when the Eiffel Tower opened, it's a bit, a bit uh, it's very important. With age restrictions and limited capacity, things aren't yet completely back to normal. Visitors must also prove they've been vaccinated or show a negative COVID test. But nobody seemed to mind. It's our first time and uh, we feel really lucky. I'm happy. <laughs> And, and just so you know, right, there was that countdown clock before the doors opened at the foot of the tower when it turned to zero. There were cheers, there was applause, visitors queuing to get in that brass band started playing as people filed through. Love and happiness all round in Paris. So nice. That is it here, the National for July 16th. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Good night.